Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this, the first Caribbean Media Summit by the Media Institute of the Caribbean and Association of Caribbean Media Workers. This is an initiative that was conceptualized at the very start of MIC, but due to COVID and many other factors, we have wait until this point. We are hoping that this is a project that we will be able to do in person next year. We are here today because we have a shared vision and purpose and because we believe in what we are doing. We believe in a free press and an independent media. The topics that we are going to talk about today are issues that impact all of us. For me, the issue of media viability is about the survival of societies. As president of the Media Institute of the Caribbean, we focus on investigative reporting, but with that portfolio comes many other issues and concerns. And if no one stands up to advocate for them, then we cannot have positive change. The threats to independent journalism and the obstacles to investigative journalism and the blockades of the right of the people to know will result ultimately in the erosion of democracy and the eradication of truth. To me, a stakeholder approach is needed right now. At this time, there has to be urgent collaboration with specific objectives. These objectives have to be sustainable. It will require the cooperation and discussion and work by media associations, government and state actors, civil society, and the public. The public needs to understand these issues. As the media, we love to report on everyone and everything, but we do a really poor job at reporting on our situation. And that is something that we need to address and deal with urgently. Reporters Without Borders released their 2022 World Press Freedom Index this morning. I don't know how many of you had the chance to see it. Interestingly, Jamaica dropped from their position seven last year to 12. We need to ask why. On the other hand, Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago moved up a little bit, not where we wanted to be, but much better than many other countries. We need to look at what are the best practices in the countries who have remained in the top five of the Press Freedom Index. Countries like Norway and Denmark and Sweden, why are they there? What are they doing that we are not? These are all um, situations that we need to observe and learn from. Having said that, the support of certain group and people are very necessary for us to continue our work. And so I'm very happy that this morning I can introduce to you to Mr. Lawrence Socha, Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Barbados, who is a supporter of today's program. And I'm hoping that Mr. Socha is with us. He will give a few remarks. Good morning, Kieran. I am indeed with you. Thank you for welcoming me to this uh, important summit this morning. On behalf of Ambassador Tagli Latella here at the U.S. Embassy in Bridgetown, Barbados, and all of our missions across the Caribbean, I want to thank you, Kieran, and the entire team at the Media Institute of the Caribbean um, for your constant support of opportunities like this to come together as journalists and media workers to talk about the issues um, that are shaping your work today. Likewise, this program would not be possible without the participation of the Association of Caribbean Media Workers. And so I'm really glad um, that, that they too are supporting this opportunity today. For the United States, freedom of speech and freedom of the press are, are our founding principles. They're enshrined in our constitution. And jokes aside, President Biden made very clear the position of the United States at the White House Correspondents' Dinner just this past weekend. And he talked about the role of journalists, both national and local journalists, journalists here in the Caribbean and around the world. And he talked about really three things, three things that are very important here in the Caribbean. That is the ongoing global pandemic, COVID-19, the generation, as he called it, reckoning with race. And we've seen that recently uh, with Barbados declaring itself a republic uh, with, with recent narratives about, uh, about issues of race and history and slavery in the region. And lastly, uh, as he called it, the existential threat of climate change, which is a challenge and a threat all too common, of course, here uh, for the island nations 
uh, of the Caribbean and those along the shores of the Caribbean in South and Central uh, America, and in, including the United States, Florida, the Gulf Coast, et cetera. Um, President Kennedy once said, and I quote, without debate, without criticism, no administration, no country can succeed and no republic can survive. President Biden called journalists and the media guardians of the truth. And that's indeed what you are. The First Amendment in the United States grants a free press extraordinary protection, but with it comes, as many of you know, a very heavy obligation to seek the truth as best you can, not to inflame or entertain, but to illuminate and educate. And I know it's tough. And as our ambassador remarked at a, at a press freedom event on World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd, the deadlines are often short and the hours for media workers and journalists are often way too long. But it is your commitment that keeps democracies, that keeps republics alive. And so I want to thank you on behalf of the United States. I want to thank the Caribbean, the Media Institute of the Caribbean and the Association of Caribbean Media Workers uh, for bringing all the people together in this event today uh, to discuss the important themes of press freedom, the state of press freedom, and what we can do to advance it. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Larry. And thank you again for your support. And thank you to your team for ensuring that you were able to be here with us today. We are moving along now to um, the lady at the helm of the Association of Caribbean Media Workers. She wears multiple hats. She's also president of the Press Association of Diana, Ms. Nazima Ragubert, and she will deliver some opening remarks. Nazima, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Kiran. And uh, good morning to all my colleagues around the region. I'm coming uh, to you from the oil producing Republic of Guyana, and I have some magic tricks. I may have blackout. Power outages are also part of our national display. Uh, this gathering today and the launch of two landmark documents on media are very important milestones for the media in this region. I take great pleasure in welcoming you, my colleagues from around the region, to this Caribbean Media Summit. We have been meeting virtually for some two years. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly changed how we interacted and ultimately how we do our work. This virtual work and our dependence on technology, IT devices, and software, or phones, highlights the importance of this year's World Press Freedom theme, Journalism on the Digital Speech. Journalism on the digital seat is up for many reasons, among them highlighting the digital threats, their safety, and the need for media workers to protect their space and how we gather information and do work. This meeting is being recorded. In our statement, we pointed out that the environment within which journalists operate in the Caribbean is becoming increasingly perilous. Many countries have already enacted legislation to intercept communication and counter what they regard as cybercrime. There is evidence to support the view that cybercrime legislation can become abused and become problematic in the context of the preservation of free expression. In a number of Caribbean countries, state entities have, have been accused of acquiring spyware that can access digital communication and undermine privacy and other rights. In our statement, the ACM urged regional governments to take all necessary steps to ensure that journalists are not targeted with the intention of revealing the identity of confidential sources. We feel that this call is necessary, and all governments, and if all governments are serious about freedom of the press, these steps should come easy. Today, we get an opportunity to hear the findings of a media viability indicators study on Jamaica. This pilot project for UNESCO through its findings is expected to give insight to industry challenges and make recommendations for media viability, which are relevant to both regional and global stakeholders. The Association of Caribbean Media Workers will also launch its State of the Caribbean Media Report through the pandemic. While this is not the first time such a compilation has been attempted in our 20 year history, it is the first time that a comprehensive report on the state of the media in our territories is being published. The report comes at a time when the media landscape has been shaken by a pandemic and tells of challenges as well as some triumphs faced by the media. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who worked on both reports and to welcome you all to this morning's historic launch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazima. 
We now move to our feature address and presentation, and I am really, really happy that Mr. Larry Kilman has been able to join us. For those of you who don't know about him, I will tell you a little bit about his journey and his career, and um, I'm sure that there's much more to it, but here's a, here's a brief. Larry Kilman is former Secretary General of the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, Juan Ifra. You all may, may have heard of that name and know it that way. They represent more than 18,000 publications, 15,000 online sites, and over 3,000 companies in more than 120 countries. Larry was responsible for overseeing the not-for-profit advocacy branch of WANIFRA, including press freedom, media development, news literacy, public affairs, world press trends, innovation, and future technologies, as well as the activities of the World Editors Forum. His career includes having served as a member of the Advisory Council of the US-based Media Institute's Global Free Speech and the Internet Program. He's a board member of the News Media Coalition and a member of the FIFA Media Committee. He worked previously as a journalist for more than 20 years in Asia, Europe, and the United States. He is currently a consultant with UNESCO and author of After the Pandemic, Building Back a Stronger Media, inspiring initiatives and in ensuring media viability. He's a gentleman I've come to earn quite a bit of respect for, and I want to thank him for looking at MIC and having included us as one of the key studies in that publication. Larry, it is a privilege to welcome you now to take the spotlight to share your feature address and presentation. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm, I'm struck uh, by the fact that as I get older, uh, it gets longer and longer. Um, I, I have had a privileged seat to uh, participate in and observe uh, changes in the, in the media industry. Uh, it continues to this day, as we all know. Um, and I'm very happy and I'm grateful to the Media Institute of the Caribbean for opportunity to talk about uh, media viability in the, in the digital and post-pandemic post age. Um, I've, uh, with these Zoom calls uh, and Zoom conferences, uh, very often we don't know where people are actually sitting. We're out in space somewhere, but I just wanted to let you know I probably get the prize for being the farthest away. Uh, I'm coming to you from Paris, France today. Um, Media viability is something that is important, um, not only to those in the news media business, uh, but to every citizen in the societies in which we live. Uh, even if many people are unaware of the dangers or failure of independent media. In the early 2000s, I attended a media conference in which a consultant from Forrester Research stood before an audience of newspaper CEOs and publishers and said, and I quote, kiss your classified advertising business goodbye, because if these ads aren't gone yet, they will be soon. For this bold statement, which we now know is prescient, she was ridiculed. Uh, how times have changed. If the loss of classified was the worst of it, we would be very lucky indeed. I have a presentation that I will share with you. In the last two decades, the business model that supported independent media, basically advertising and sales revenue, has all but collapsed. News media everywhere are struggling to find new models as the bulk of advertising revenue goes to a handful of digital giants, and the rest is distributed by a vastly higher number of outlets, some that aren't even de facto news providers at all. The competition, competition for attention is fierce and differentiating between credible news and dis and misinformation has become difficult. It is well known that print media circulation has fallen steeply in recent years and broadcast media audiences are fragmented. Media organizations have struggled to make money from the migration to online platforms, particularly local news outlets. 
There have been well-documented cutbacks on investigative journalism, shrinking newsrooms, and the capture of some media by oligarchic or political forces. The economic viability of independent news and information is threatened by several factors. As I mentioned, the collapse of the advertising dependent business model with the duopoly of Google and Facebook taking most of the media advertising that news outlets, a decline in the level of trust in the news. According to the Reuters Institute Digital News Report, drawn from a survey of 75,000 people in 38 markets, about half of the respondents don't even trust the news media they use themselves. The reduction in media pluralism, which is at risk in many countries due to high levels of news media concentration, less transparency and ownership and reduced economic sustainability. These problems are exacerbated, but for independent media in less developed economies and repressive environments, where the safety of journalists is compromised, outlets face forcible closure, or the audience for independent news simply does not have the revenue to support them. Most of the factors I've just mentioned have been accelerated by the global COVID pandemic, which shuttered many small advertisers reduced spending across the board and made it exceedingly difficult for news outlets to function. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, and I'm not repeating these well-known facts to simply scare you. Many of you and your colleagues across the news business are developing and sharing new models that will support independent news media in the future. News media should be commended for this work, but unfortunately it is often dismissed or rather, the role of media in society is often taken for granted and misunderstood. But as the challenges accelerate, so have the solutions, which is what I've been asked to talk to you about today. While news media has been struggling for a long time to respond to the disruption that is killing its business, they have, quite frankly, failed to make the case of why for many news consumers, the news is flowing like never before. The deeper understanding of where the, that news comes from is not something they are entirely aware of or even care about. Even worse, large segments of society that distrust news see the challenges as deserved comeuppance for self-interested media companies and wealthy publishers. We are now in a situation Whole communities are watching their last remaining local news sources close their doors, leaving what is termed news deserts. In many communities, the traditional watchdogs that prevent or uncover corruption, wrongdoing, and incompetence have simply disappeared. This problem has become so dire that a growing number of people outside of the news industry are becoming concerned as they recognize that democratic society is threatened if citizens don't receive the credible news and information they need to make informed decisions. There is growing recognition that the problems of the news business are the problems of society as a whole. This is why what was once the domain of media themselves, finding ways to increase revenue to allow the businesses to function, so the newsrooms could continue providing their essential service to society is now a rising concern of governments, intergovernmental organizations, foundations, non-governmental organizations, and others who fear nothing less than the extinction of independent news. There have been increasing initiatives from within the industry and outside to develop new hybrid business models that combine commercial activities with nonprofits grants, and other non-traditional sources of funding. There have been efforts to level the playing field so monopolistic platforms don't damage the essential sources of credible news. And there have been efforts to increase media literacy so citizens can determine whether the information they receive is trustworthy. As this particular slide highlights, at the heart of these efforts is the fundamental assumption that independent journalism is a public good, deserving the same support as other essential services 
that keep honest and democratic societies functioning. As an example, I'm going to talk about one such initiative, one I have been involved in at UNESCO that brings together a wide array of partners and projects. Firstly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with UNESCO and its work, UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which seeks to build peace through international cooperation in education, sciences and culture. The UNESCO Media Viability Initiative is conducted by UNESCO's International Program for the Development of Communication, the only multilateral forum in the UN system designed to mobilize the international community to discuss and promote development. The program not only provides uh, support for media projects, but also seeks to secure a healthy environment for the growth of free and pluralistic media in developing countries. The Media Viability Project focuses on 10 countries, Indonesia and Pakistan in Asia, Tunisia and Lebanon in the Middle East, Senegal, Namibia and Nigeria in Africa, Brazil and El Salvador in Latin America, and Jamaica in the Caribbean. These countries were chosen for the diversity of their media ecosystems and the ability to extrapolate the results to similar media markets elsewhere. As I mentioned, the project is collaborative. UNESCO's IPDC is working with Economist Impact, which is the research arm of the Economist Group, the Dutch-based media NGO Free Press Unlimited, the US-based International Center for Journalists, WANIFRA, which is the World Association of News Publishers, the Global Forum for Media Development, and the multi-donor program on freedom of expression and safety of journalists. The project involves these elements. UNESCO's World, Press, uh, World Trends in Freedom of Expression and Media Development Report, which this year focuses on journalism as a public good. The report is the definitive source of information on trends in media freedom, pluralism, independence, and the safety of journalists. Complementing the trends report, we have new research conducted by Economist Impact, which found that COVID-19 intensified economic pressures facing the global news media industry. Outlets in low and middle income countries have been the most severely impacted with a rate of decline almost two times faster than the global average. This has led to newsroom closures, layoffs, and pay cuts for journalists at a time when access to trustworthy information is desperately needed. National consultations and knowledge sharing conducted by Free Press Unlimited, which provides an opportunity for media executives to discuss the challenges and issues they face and share the multiple ways they are responding to them. The project includes policy recommendations conceived in collaboration with the International Center for Journalists and media experts at Columbia University. Among other things, the recommendations call for intensifying more inclusive journalism, alternative business models, and diversified revenue streams, urgent action to save and expand the range of news providers serving the pub public, and injections of revenue from outside sources that do not compromise editorial and editorial independence. In addition to these elements, my contribution was a book of case studies of initiatives conducted by media companies themselves. I'm not going to describe all the 11 cases in the book, I will leave it to you to download and read about these initiatives, which hopefully will inspire you to emulate them. Several themes, however, have emerged from the cases I examined. Cooperation is one. News media are by definition competitive businesses and getting them to cooperate, cooperate for their mutual benefit requires a culture change. There is growing recognition of structural problems facing news media cannot be solved by single companies alone. Education is another. The next generation of journalists entering the workforce have less opportunities in traditional media and more at smaller startups and as independent contractors. 
Journalism schools not only have to prepare them with journalistic skills, but also with entrepreneurial tools. Several of the media professionals interviewed for my report said they returned to business school after starting their own businesses because while they had excellent journalistic credentials, they knew nothing about running a business. These skills now need to be incorporated into traditional journalism education. The report also highlights that all media markets are not created equal. There is often an assumption that the trends and developments in news media caused by dis digital disruption are universal and that only the speed of change is different. So it is understandable if you, if you think that news media everywhere have given up on advertising as a significant future source of revenue and everyone is concentrating on developing subscription and reader revenue. But in three of the world's most populous countries, China, India, and Indonesia, advertising remains a significant generator of revenue for traditional media and will be for the foreseeable future. It is important to understand that local conditions vary greatly. Quite frankly, it was inspiring to see the innovations and the thinkers who are developing and implementing these projects and to watching them succeed. These cases provide hope and a model for others in similar markets. The UNESCO project is just one example. Similar coalitions are blooming around the world, all aimed to building an understanding among policymakers and citizens that journalism is essentially a public good necessary to the good functioning of society, and that new in multiple ways must be found to support independent news media in the digital world post-pandemic. The work is obviously far from done and the results are not guaranteed, but the work itself is showing promising avenues which are likely to grow in future. And we can explore this further in the panel discussions later. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Larry. And just so everyone knows, I know that a lot of questions may come to you, you know, having listened to Larry speak. I ask you to please make notes because we will have the panel discussion and you will be asked to place your questions in the chat box and our moderator will be able to take that. So having listened to Larry and the fact that building back a stronger media is important and, and it is also necessary for us to customize the approaches in each of the countries we are in because our circumstances are so different. It shows why there is a need for specific mechanisms, but it also shows that this is why the media viability indicators become so important. So in, in understanding what is needed, UNESCO approached MIC and we were very, very happy and um, you know, we were thrilled actually to be asked to do the pilot study and they chose Jamaica um, to be able to do that. In searching for um, another researcher and somebody to lead the project, it was very important to find someone who really understood the business environment and the guts of the media industry, so to speak. So it is my uh, privilege to introduce Mr. Brian Schmidt. He has been in the industry for over 30 years, but he has worked on all sides of it, which is why I think he was the perfect person to work on this study. And um, he has been in the advertising industry, has worked in civil society. He is deputy chairman of the Jamaica Debates Commission. He is a former chairman of the Media Association of Jamaica, and he still is in media. So I hand over to Brian with his presentation on the key highlights of the MBI study. And Brian, you are on mute. I'm so sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Kiran, for, for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to just take this opportunity before we start to thank UNESCO for this very, very important initiative. Um, I, think, I think it's very important when we consider the state of media where we are now and where it could go. And this sort of action is very, very important for us to, to ensure as best as possible that we have a strong journalistic environment. As Larry had mentioned, you know, there is the overarching public good that is provided by journalism. And it is something that we in fact 
need to defend. So the background to this study is that UNESCO is acutely aware of the dangers that are facing the, the media industry, right? Um, Brian, hold on. We're not seeing your slide view. Can I, can I ask you to go to slide view, please? One moment, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sharing now. Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, um, the background to the study is that UNESCO is, is concerned and aware of the challenges facing media. And as they have said, this set of indicators concerns news media organizations. So within this perspective, viability is an underpinning component of a free, independent and pluralistic uh, media landscape. Fostering such viability is an important pillar of media development. Um, UNESCO has seven media indicators and we were charged to do research on the light version of their viability indicators, which includes indicators A, B, D, and F, which are presented in our study, which will be released very shortly. So the viability indicators are A, the presence of a supportive economic and business environment, B, the structure and scope of the media economy, C, the media labor market, and F, the organizational structures and resources that support financial and market sustainability. And as I mentioned, there are three other indicators that UNESCO has that were not a part of this study, but it is important to note that they look on these things, which is the financial health of media operations, including advertising, uh, the capital environment for media operations, and their contribution to the national economies. So the methodology of the research, which was conducted by Kiran and myself, was on three planks. One, we did interviews with 27 stakeholders, including media managers, journalists, educators, and so on. We did surveys. Three groups were surveyed, journalists, media managers, and academics. And we also did research based on existing, we, we did studies based on existing research. Now, it is very important to note that a lot of research does not exist in Jamaica. So we did the very best we can with some of the limited research that exists. But what were the key findings? To, to all of us here, there is, I don't think there's going to be, there are going to be many surprises. Big tech and social media, were one of the main challenges for the media industry, the contraction of the economy, the consequences of the pandemic, you know, with severe cuts in revenue, staff cuts in newsrooms, and of course, the impact of disinformation on the industry. But let's break out these findings now vis-a-vis -vis the indicators. So media viability indicator A was the presence of a supportive economic and business environment. Well, the first thing we, one of the very striking things is that advertising revenue declined, which we knew, but it was up to 90% due to COVID. There was constantly increasing costs due to devaluation and inflation. We had reducing disposable income. There was this unregulated presence of big tech. Local media were particularly challenged because they were earning, as they said, peanuts from content used by big tech. So what you have is that the main producers of the content were by far earning the least from their content. And they also didn't even have the choice in many cases whether their content was being used or not and how it was being used. There's legislation of course, that hinders um, the ability of media to, to function properly. And I think it was Nazima who mentioned things around data protection acts. And this is a very, very real issue. There, in Jamaica, we have an issue as well of excessive defamation awards, which has a chilling effect on journalism. Um, in contrast to what we found, even though these things were negative, there are some positives. There are 
few legislative barriers to enter the industry. If you're moving into print, there are no legislative barriers at all. If you're going into electronic media, there are no legislative barriers, but there are, leg there are regulations um, that are necessary to come into the industry. And of course, if you're in a social media space, there are no legislative barriers at all. Something that's very significant though, is that literacy is probably not sufficient to support text-based media in the Jamaican context. And certainly in terms of a supportive economic and business environment, there are no incentives for local media. When we look at media viability indicator B, which reflects on the structure and scope of the media economy, we found that there were many losses in print media. You know, particularly magazines, we now only have two newspaper outlets as opposed to many more in the past and the magazine industry is almost extinct. The electronic media, however, has remained relatively stable, but there is growth in the social media space. What we do see happening though, is that there's greater concentration of ownership of media, which actually runs counter to the policy that was expressed in the late eighties and early nineties of the government to encourage liberalization and diversity in ownership of media. So what we're seeing is that there is an almost reversal of what was intended and seen as very important to journalism. Pluralism, of course, is threatened as there's greater concentration of ownership. And the business models are under threat, as Larry mentioned. Um, and a lot of this threat comes from big tech, even telecoms and fake news. Uh, smaller media houses are really under severe pressure, even more so than the larger media houses. Um, online, there's limited purchasing power. So some of the potential for growth does not really exist that we think may be there. And of course, being a small island state, we have a small advertising economy with a shrinking pie, with more, more players biting into that pie. Um, so what this has done, it has highlighted that there's a need to earn hard currency, uh, whichever way you do it, whether it is syndication, subscription, um, leveraging social media and what have you. However, this is very, very difficult to profitably monetize because customers, whether it is your corporate customers in, in terms of syndication or individual customers in terms of private citizens are generally reluctant to pay for media content because they've grown up in an environment of free to air media. Under media viability indicator C, the media labor market has shown that the wages compensation is definitely low compared to other industries. Media now consequently is seen as a stepping stone by many journalists to other jobs in other industries. So they typically they're moving into communication jobs in the private sector, in government or in the political realm. Uh, the number of jobs, however, has remained relatively stable despite um, some losses. Some of the losses that we had during COVID um, have come back. Some of those jobs have come back, but what you're seeing is that there is a bit of a redeployment of staff in, in media houses. So the composition of the deployment of staff is now changing a bit. Um, what is a, of serious concern is that the level of available talent is declining and that has a direct impact on the output of um, media houses. COVID of course, as Larry indicated earlier, has just exacerbated all of these issues which were present before uh, media hiring, though, on, on, the, on the good side, we found that media hiring is very equitable. There was no evidence of any sort of discrimination or biases or anything like that in media hiring. Um, and media workers do have access to training opportunities, whether it is at the tertiary level, whether it is through a CPTC and other, um, other, other outlets. 
under indicator F, this is organizational structures and resources which support financial and market sustainability. So what we're talking about here is what is the structure of these media houses and are they structured in a way to help them survive going into the future? Well, what was very apparent is that community media and smaller media houses definitely needed more structured business and finance plans. Um, it was interesting to see that they are basically lurching from day to day because they were in a survivability mode and not a viability mode. Um, larger media houses face very similar issues of being in a survivability mode and not a viability mode, but they have staff that are dedicated, however, to revenue generation, unlike smaller and community media houses where almost everybody's a jack of all trades and everybody's just doing what they can to keep the doors open. Um, there's, we don't really have that much regular market and audience data to help drive certain strategic decisions. And that is particularly difficult for smaller media houses. The reason being is that A, they can't afford to commission their own research. So it's only the larger media houses that can do that. And the only consistent research outside of this is all media research, which only comes out once a year. But when you disaggregate that information because their market shares are so small, there's very little meaningful audience data that they can get from it because of the sample size, which is typically about 2,000 respondents. Um, despite all of this, most media houses, including the smaller ones, do have proper contracts and paperwork to conduct business. So in terms of the interface with customers and the security of doing business from that point of view, that is fine at pretty much all levels of media. There is though, interestingly, large differences in the composition of boards of directors. What you find is that this, as, as uh, media houses get smaller, they tend to either not have boards of directors or active boards, and their boards tend to be populated more by people who are close to the operators of these media houses rather than people who are qualified. So that's very interesting. But of course, larger media houses have more accountable boards that have greater depth in talent that are helping them to move ahead considering all of the challenges that face them. So this, these are the key findings. And you know what was also very interesting when we did our research is we found that there was a large consistency in what respondents had to say, irrespective of where they were, whether they were in the private sector, whether they were in academia or whether they're in media. So it was very, very apparent, this high degree of consistency of understanding of what is happening in the media. So it is very, very clear that this is a real and apparent threat. So what are the, the next steps? Well, the Media Institute of the Caribbean will be doing a full launch and presentation of this research in just a few weeks time. And coming out of that, that stakeholder meeting where the research will be presented, the MIC would like to get an agreement from those stakeholders to develop an action plan of a few initiatives that can be implemented within the next six months or so to get things moving in the right direction. Because you know we in the Caribbean do have an issue and we, we at MIC are trying to break it, which is there are tons and tons and tons of studies, but there's no action afterwards. So what we would like to do is move from just having a study to creating action that will help to lead to greater viability of the traditional media sector. Thank you, everyone. Kiran, over to you. Thank you, Brian. So um, we really hope that this is something we will be able to replicate throughout the region because, you know, friends, it's no sense that we have the, this issue and we know what 
um, all of the contributing factors and we do nothing about it. It's very, very important that we become proactive and action oriented in whatever we do and more so for the sake of our industry. So we look forward to that and we look forward to sharing the outcome of that stakeholder meeting with you in a few weeks time. The report is available on the website. And um, I did make mention of the fact that we are quite willing um, to talk to our fellow journalists in the region or anyone else um, about the report so that we can cooperate and work together to find the solutions. So we move now into the panel discussion. I will be part of that panel discussion, but it's going to be moderated by someone who is a star, much bigger star than I am. Um, I call her star girl all of the time. That's my nickname for her. Uh, Dion Jackson Miller is going to be moderating the session. Dion, good morning. Hey, Kieran. Okay, so hi everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to see you all here. So the, the discussion of this particular panel is on media viability and independent journalism. And having heard those two presentations, I'm really eager to get into it. So let me just introduce the panelists for you very quickly. Um, Larry was introduced earlier by Kieran, so I won't repeat that. No, in terms of George Davis, president of the Press Association of Jamaica, no, George is the youngest president of the PHA. And I would say to you, He's also executive producer and host of Sports Max, host of Sports Zone and The Conversation. And anytime I try hype on him about my program, then and kind of look for me and say, boy, Dion, 27 countries, 18 million viewers, is 18 million eyes more, George. You know, <laughs> I cannot stop listening at that point. So looking forward to hearing George's perspective. In terms of Kieran, instead of sharing her bio with you, I could just say powerhouse, determined, won't take no for an answer and press freedom warrior. But just in case you want some more, she's co-founder as well as current president of the Media Institute of the Caribbean and the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. As a former correspondent for CNN World Report, she has her own stories about the problems of that investigative journalist face and potential dangers. And she's working on her own model of financing independent media. So also looking forward to that. And Brian, no, Brian is a senior manager and marketing executive and board member of Grove Broadcasting. And for anybody who just said what, I would say two things to you. Iri FM <laughs> and Zip, <laughs> Zip FM, and that should answer all questions. And he's also a former chairman of the Media Association of Jamaica. All right, so we have an hour for the discussion. So how I'm going to run it is that for the first 15 minutes, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to the panel. After that, I'll hand it over to you guys so you can start getting your questions and your comments ready in the meantime. And for the final five minutes, I'll just go around the room and everybody could get a uh, final wrap up comment. And let me kick it off by asking about, um, Larry, let me start with you if I could, because the, the comments that Brian was making about big tech and um, concerns about local media and their content being used by big tech. So, you know, the, the, the Twitters, the Facebooks of this world, and they're not benefiting. It would seem like it's a problem, I would think, all across the world. But at the same time, I'm not sure I see how we're going to efficiently get our content out if we don't, in fact, use big tech. Can you share any thoughts you might have on how this is being seen in, in different areas and perhaps some of the strategies that are being used to deal with that? If you're speaking, Larry, you're muted. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, uh, firstly, it, it's it's a big question. It gets asked at every single media conference I've ever I've ever been in. And what's what's really interesting in these discussions is there's always uh, there's always agreement that something has to be done, but then there becomes a cacophony of voices about what exactly that is. And there's been, there's, there's really no consensus on, on how to deal with it, only that it needs to be dealt with. There are initiatives like the Australian uh, initiative uh, and, and the Canadian initiative. The Australian has already been passed into law, the Canadian is, is, is not yet there. Uh, that will basically allow, it would basically allow uh, news media to, uh, uh, negotiate jointly uh, with the big platforms 
for a, a licensing uh, agreement to, to pay for their content. Uh, this would allow smaller media companies, of course, the big media companies have their um, uh, partnerships uh, already, but this will allow smaller, smaller outlets that perhaps the giant platforms aren't interested in talking to directly uh, to, to, to deal with that. Uh, in, the in the countries I mentioned where advertising is still a, a, a large uh, revenue generator. Uh, there is I'm sorry to interrupt you, Larry. I'm just getting one or two messages asking if you could just project a little bit more. Sure. Um, in, in the bigger countries, in the countries I mentioned earlier, uh, Indonesia, China, and, and India, where advertising is still rather strong, uh, part of that is, is that there is some control over uh, the presence of the large platforms in the markets. Um, and there is a feeling in, in that it has to continue or, or grow, uh, that there needs to be regulation in, in, uh, in, as well. Uh, but again, how that would be accomplished, there are many different, many different proposals on, on how to deal with that. Okay, could I ask Brian now to, to, Brian, let me ask you to pick that up. And is part of the issue perhaps that, that our local and regional media houses need to become a little bit more agile, a little bit more innovative in terms of how to monetize. And I give an, as an example, for instance, the Jamaica Observer has started this product that they're calling Business Bites, which is you know short videos giving news on business news that they put on IG and on Twitter, but the videos themselves are sponsored. So is that the kind of thinking we need to engage more in, in to some extent more? Um, I think that, there, there has to be a, a multi-level approach to, to what is happening here because what the observer is doing and, and a bunch of other media houses are doing, they, they are trying to come up with ways to get content sponsored. They're trying to find ways to earn from it directly. And, and you're right, um, media houses cannot roll over and play dead. They, they are active participants in the industry, so they have to do what they need to do to try and survive. And as you said, they need to be more agile and that sort of thing. But you, you do have an issue that, that still exists, is that if the advertising industry is under threat in and of itself, you, you run into a situation where those sources of revenue can dry up even in the digital space. So you still need to have a, a, a broader, legislative national policy towards how big tech is handled. And in fact, I would say what we probably need to do is have a regional policy where, so where we're, as a region, we can say the, this is the Caribbean's position and negotiate as a block of, of, um, of governments rather than you know, single, single territories, because at the end of the day, we really are a bunch of very, very small countries, but as a group, it is a significant uh, market. So you need to have a multi-leveled um, approach, in my opinion. You're on mute, Dion. Boy, falling victim to that myself. Um, <laughs> George, your thoughts on that? Well, you, you know, I'm I'm agreeing with, 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 with Brian um, that it has to be a regional joined up approach. The individual country, uh, lone soldier, lone wolf, one country against the world will not work. It's not as if it may not work. It will not work in this regard. What is also true is that innovation is going to be at the key of how media houses do what they do. Uh, hands up how many people in this room have ever read a physical copy of Bleacher Report or have ever read score.com, eyebrows raised because nobody has ever read a physical copy. These two uh, portals, as I'm gonna call them, are among the most popular on social media for churning out sporting related content. If you are, the NBA is being played and Brian Schmidt dunks over Wesley Gibbings within a minute of that happening, score.com has that on their, on their website or on their social media and they put it out. And when you do a review hours later, that video got 530,000 plays, another video got, a one, got 1 million and so forth. So what I'm saying is that these are companies who've 
assess the landscape and say, okay, how do I, that, that well-worn phrase about bang for the buck, how do I give my advertiser bang for the buck by doing something that breaks through the clutter? Because the principles of advertising, as I learned it when I did marketing in university, is that you want to break through clutter. How do you do that? So the observers of this world, the, the Guardian Media Group in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the, 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 the major publications in Antigua, wherever, they have to find ways of putting information out that people will consume, not in the traditional way, but will also, but, and, and which will also carry across a broad section of the, the, their population, of their various publics. And then you go to your advertiser and say, see, this has gotten X number of rotations. This has gotten X number of plays because the way we traditionally do it, we can't do it the traditional way that we've been doing it. Then go and ask for a legislative tool to help us continue to do it the traditional way when the whole world is going a different way and innovating that won't work. Right. And Kiran? Yeah, let me say that I agree with everyone. I think that there is a lack of will, a lack of cooperation and collaboration. And that concerns me because if we really see this problem and we want to change it, we need to do something about it. And I think we have to realize that there is a point we are at now where we have to stop thinking about the competition amongst ourselves. I think that is the first problem we have. And we have to look at the, the strategies that we're implementing almost as concentric circles. Me, the media entity, and I have to be innovative. I have to drive you know, th this business model that I have. And outside of that, what is happening on the national level? What can be done? And then regionally, and then how do we collaborate with our colleagues globally? You know, I have a firm belief that you can be a warrior or a warrior. I think we have too many warriors, W-O-R-R-I-E-R -R -R -E now, and not enough warriors, W-A-R-R-I-O-R. -R -R. That is how I've lived my whole life. And I think that this is the point we are at. We have to realize that if we sit back and do nothing and we don't start the collaborative um, approach and do what Australia is doing, Canada has just implemented some initiatives as well. Um, it's up on the news media site. We are seeing the same thing in the US model out of the democracy summit and what President Biden has suggested the USAID and a media viability accelerator. There are lots of examples that are happening now, but how do we adapt and adopt to our environment to make it work? So I want to say that I think that the first thing is that we have to have the will and realize, forget about competition. We are going to die. If we don't do something now, we are going to die and our societies are what are at risk. And I don't hear that messaging enough. So I'm really pleading this morning with all of my colleagues in media, journalists, you know, you are the heroes. We always say hats off to you, but you know what? You need to save yourselves and you need to save our society and we have to get the messaging out. Okay, so one more question from me and then I'll start taking your questions from the audience. I noticed a, a whole discussion going on in the chat, so I'll share some of those in just a moment as well. But the emphasis that had been placed on small independent startups, and Larry made that point in his presentation that journalism schools now need to start teaching students entrepreneurship as well, because there's only so many people that you know the traditional media houses can absorb. And plus, the young people, they're not happy with what we're paying them anyway. <laughs> so people do want to go out and do their own thing. And you know, we have a couple of really successful example, shout out to Kalila Reynolds Media, our colleague in the Press Association of Jamaica, who is doing her own thing now. But outside of the one or two vis very visible ones, we, we talk about it, but but is it working? Do we do we see them flourishing? Larry? Uh... I think it's early, it's early to it's early. there are there are some that are that are thriving, um, usually small startups um, that that are just one or two people and it, it doesn't generate a lot of revenue but they break even or make a slight profit. Um, what what's interesting is there are now curricula being written uh, and introduced in and in implemented in journalism schools. Uh, to, to start that change. Uh, the recognition is there. The problem is academia is very slow to change and the way journalism is taught is the way it's always been taught. So there has to be a culture change in academia as well to understand this difference. Um, just, just as an example, I mentioned that I, I spoke to people who went back to get their MBAs um, 
And essentially the mechanism of this, there, there was, there was a, there's a, uh, a fact-checking newswire in Brazil. The founder of it had written a fact-checking uh, column for the newspaper she worked for uh, during the election, the last presidential election. They, the newspaper canceled it uh, after the election. They didn't feel it was necessary, but she saw some future in it. And, and, and left and started it up as a, as a startup, uh, providing fact-checking weekly columns to all Brazilian media, uh, uh, education projects, things like that. But even basic things like how do you price a column when you're selling it to uh, various media? You know, how do you do that? You need, some, you need some advice on that. She went back and got her MBA because she simply didn't have those skills. But I think as, as the traditional uh, jobs are reduced and the startup jobs increase, I think there's going to be pressure on the schools to make that change. Okay. What do you think, Kieran, especially with your experience in you know, starting something new with the, the regional investigative network? Yeah, I mean, and outside of that, I started four other companies that are all private, you know, and let me tell you, um, we have to do more mentoring as well. I put a lot of blame on um, the leaders in our industry, my peers, because I think that it, we, we, have, we don't have a succession plan, actually. I don't think that we do. We are not doing sufficient mentoring. You know, I know very few of us who do. I am mentoring three um, people right now. One of them is in media, you know, mainly women entrepreneurs. But the thing is, we don't do a lot of mentoring. And I think that that is also something that can be introduced in terms of the smaller independent media operators who I have a lot of regard for because they do this out of passion. We also need to look at the possibility of a consolidation model between small independent operators. Right now it's a situation of the big gobbling up the small, right? And so you have that merger and acquisition, but there is nothing wrong that with, within our region of the coming together of the smaller outfits to produce news and produce content and share it across borders. It is going to enhance, enhance the cross-border collaboration, but it is definitely in my mind also going to provide opportunities and provide opportunities for those students. I don't see meaningful internships being done. I mean, at my private media house, you know, we take interns twice a year. You know, some of them don't work out, but I don't think it is done sufficiently because I think even the people who are lecturing at some of these institutions don't have the first hand experience. And I think it has to be compulsory, a compulsory part of the training and development has to be that you do internship in various aspects of the industry because you have to understand it. The textbook is not going to work. And that is really where my thoughts are. What can really become practical out of all of this? All right, and George, your thoughts? The, the, the thing is this, you, you said something <clears throat> about entrepreneurship being part of the the media a training program that the tertiary institutions offer, you know, I sat here thinking and I'm saying perhaps it is that only the field of theology would represent an, a program of study that wouldn't require entrepreneurship to be taught as a basic course, as a fundamental course. I can't think of anything that you wouldn't need those skills in given the reality of the world. Let me give you an example. Let me set up a construct quickly. A student leaving NCU, that's Northern Caribbean University here in Jamaica, Central Jamaica, at the University of Technology, and, uh, the, and Caramac, of course. These students are leaving schools with skills now that none of us who are over a certain age, perhaps over 30, had when we were graduating. You're talking about people with skills in video editing, photo editing, they can voice for, 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 for production pieces, they can present live, they can do everything. You're talking about, you're, you're producing people that, almost, that, are, that are almost mini media houses with a range of skills they have. What future is there for this person? Does that person go to align themselves with an existing uh, entity or do they have enough skills where they can band together with two or three persons like-minded or two or three persons who can help them with financing and start their own business. Small businesses come, small businesses go. It's the essence of what small businesses are. You're gonna have an explosion in them being created and an explosion in them crashing and the ones that crash are replaced by new ones. The fact of the matter is that the, com the, the entities that exist now who are justifiably concerned about what big tech is doing to the advertising dollar, I don't think they ideate very well. 
they get in rooms amongst themselves and it's an echo chamber. Oh, you know, I think this should be done. I think that should be done. The young people are not even not necessarily just young people, the people around them in the rest of the organization who have ideas that can drive their innovation and tailor that innovation to a winning formula that can compel an advertiser to spend advertising dollars with them. Those people are not consulted. That is a large part of the reason why we are facing an existential threat if we don't act, because the ideation is not open to the people who can seed the movement towards getting more from the advertising dollar. And the fact is, again, the last point I'm making, last point I'm making, we all, we all live in countries where there are things being sold. There, there is a market, there is money around. The question is, how do we get the money? And the last, last point, Leon, is this. I think that some of the entities that, including the ones that we work for and have worked for, they are frightened, scared now, because they're looking around and say, oh, the traditional way we used to make money is under threat. And oh my gosh, the traditional way we used to make money is under threat. As if they wanted to make money the traditional way for the next 200 years. No, it has to change, it has to adapt to the times. And as I'm saying, the approach is, is to open up the ideation process, look at the thing, see how we can band together across borders as Kiran is always advocating, as Brian advocates as well, and see how we can prevent a unified front. So we'll do something on the legislative end, but from the business end, nuts and bolts, we are innovating and we have tools ready for the advertiser to lap up. Yeah, no, I loved a lot of those points. I mean, even if you think about people who are doing computer repairs, for instance, they're, they're going to be setting up their own business. So I like the idea of having um, entrepreneurship as a, perhaps like as one of you is foundation courses, like the use of English or, or DevOps or whatever they call it nowadays. Brian, your comment on that? Um, I, I, I'm in, in full support of the comments so far. I think as somebody who is on the leading and bleeding <laughs> edge of trying to find the money and come up with things to do, um, one of the big challenges we have is scale. And, and we need to just be realistic, we have scale. In the same way that, uh, um, like Jamaica, for instance, cannot support a Walmart, right? Or an Antigua cannot support a Walmart. So there are things we need to understand about scale of business that, that's important. No. Understanding that, you probably need to say, what can I do to improve the scale of my content? So for instance, what George was mentioning earlier about um, these sites that are giving you all the updates on the NBA and so on. Why can't somebody in this region set up a business like that? Because we, we are media entities. We don't necessarily have to do Caribbean or local specific content, you can do international content. And then that opens you to a, a, a different realm of possibilities. And I think um, really and truly going forward, that is something that um, entrepreneurs are going to have to look on because you just have to understand scale. You know, a lot of people are doing things, they're doing some amount of social media or whatever. And I say, boy, you know, I got 10,000 people to, to like this or view this or listen to this. We, that's not, that's, you can't monetize that. What are you, you going to do with that? You need to have a certain amount of scale. So we need to really start looking on the scale of what we do. That's very, very important. It means that we need to be looking on how we approach content. Okay. Opening it up to the audience now. Let me go first. Let me stick with Bran because you've been talking about regionalism. And I have Janika in the chat saying, now we come to the herding cats part of the problem when it comes to regional integration. Yes? regional collaboration, and Carlton says CARICOM should have started. This CBU raises issue for some time now. Uh, somebody who has been covering Caribbean issues and, and CARICOM for only for years, Brian, I have to tell you, my faith is waning <laughs> that we can actually get it together. Do you think it's likely that we will? Oh, boy. <laughs> this is... It this is something that I, I think can be done, but it has to be driven by the media associations and the press associations of the region to force our government to come to the table. If we're going to wait on the governments to suddenly wake up and say, you know, this is something we need to do, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. So the advocacy is going to have to come from within our own ranks at the association levels. And also too, you know, you touched on something very important earlier, Dion. 
And Kiran said it as well, as a media industry, we have done a horrific job of promoting and educating around our issues and concerns. Every industry that exists uses traditional media to forward their positions, whether it's tourism, whether it's banking and finance, retail, whatever. They use our news platforms to further their positions, to get the kind of actions that they need as an industry. And we need to do it. I know there is this overarching thing that we don't want to see that we are abusing our position of influence and so on. But you know, there's a time when you just have to be pragmatic and realistic and just do what needs to be done. Otherwise, you 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 run the risk of being overrun. Okay, Earl Moxham and then Dennis Chabrol. Earl. Thank you, Dion. Um, yeah, thank you, Dion. Thus far, in respect of the question of how do we keep journalists and journalism viable, I have not heard enough attention being given to one important factor. So when, for example, Larry speaks of, and necessarily so, of the journalists going back to business school, for example, to learn how to operate as a business, the question that arises in respect of the individual journalist now becoming his or her own business manager. What happens when the firewall between the reporting and the business collapses? What happens then in respect of the genuine independence of the reporting when that journalist might have to be forced or find himself or herself in a position where he or she is tempted to compromise the integrity of the reporting in order to secure the financing. Thanks, Earl. Who wants to take that? Larry? Yeah, this is uh, what Earl just said is a concern in every newsroom that is undergoing digital transformation. When there are proposals to uh, what the, the newsroom side, the journalists might see as breaking down the walls uh, is, uh, is a issue that uh, experience shows has to be dealt with uh, very, very carefully. Uh, in, in newsrooms I've been involved in where this is raised, um, journalists, you know, most of most of the of the proposals uh, for breaking so-called breaking down these walls have to do with data sharing and using uh, data to to, to uh, basically audience-driven newsrooms is is really the way it goes. And what happens in successful newsrooms is in area. This has traditionally been the area of marketing, and uh, there is resistance to it at first, but when journalists can be assured that uh, sharing data across departments like this does not uh, compromise editorial integrity, that, that the reporting stays consistently independent, uh, but, the, but the way audiences are reached involves sharing data. They gener it generally takes care of the concerns. The truth of the matter is the you know, and, and, and people often hear this as saying, no, we are advocating breaking down the walls. It's not that at all. Uh, projects that take the reality of the market into consideration, what needs to be done to drive the business requires the sharing of, of data, for example, requires a new newsroom outlook on how to reach audiences. But doing that without compromising editorial independence is possible. And it not only possible, it is the way to go. But it's clear that there is no way ahead without these old traditional church state kind of issues being confronted. They have to be confronted. Kieran, I'd love your thoughts on that as well as somebody who is in that space where you seek funding and at the same time you're developing this, this new model of investigative journalism. 
Yeah, I think it's a very difficult question. And it really is going to depend on the individuals. I don't think that every journalist has to understand the, the business or how to run it or run it effectively. I think they need to have an understanding, as Larry said, of the data and how it works to be able to understand how you get feedback from the market and then filter content into the market to a certain degree. But it should never take away from the independent reporting we have to do. We do not have a lot of nonprofit news entities in this region. I think CIJN is the only one. I think there is one in Puerto Rico as well. But, you know, Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network was set up as a nonprofit. And we've been fortunate, you know, to, to have been able to get funding to continue our independent work. I think that we as media, the media associations in particular, need to look at how we developed develop that kind of funding and can we have a foundation working through corporates and the private sector to encourage that kind of reporting. We need to think out of the box a little bit with how we make media viable. And the truth is um, that, you know, when you look at what is happening, I'm looking at the U.S. because they're one of the few markets who has done it, right? They have their, um, their new Support for Local Journalism Act. And they are looking at how they are funding independent reporting and smaller media outfits because community media is very important. They call it community media on our scale. It's national media for a lot of our countries, right? But they have come up with a way where corporates are getting involved, where there is a tax and so on, and they can make this feasible. And I think we need to look at that road. I don't feel, and, and it was actually one of the findings out of the, the MVI study, I don't feel that we have engaged private sector and some of these business service organizations sufficiently to get them to understand and to help us to work on developing a new model. And I think that that is another area we need to look at. Call it nonprofit news. You don't want it tarnished. Call it nonprofit news and let us find a way to make it sustainable. And as I said, it may not be by an by individual media entities where many of us have one-man operations and there's maybe just two or three of us running this website or this radio station. But look at how we can come together and adopt an, a consolidated approach and become more sustainable and therefore economically viable. Goes back to the issue, I think, of innovative thinking. And as George says, we can't just sit down and say we're doing the same thing, that we have to find ways to deal with that. Dennis, let me bring you in here. Dennis Chabron. Hi, good morning, colleagues. Um, belated World, Happy World Press Freedom Day. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, add to the discourse by suggesting that um, in instances where there is this fear, legitimate as it is, um, about a conflict of interest between um, advertisers and the journalists, perhaps that can be a built-in component in any agreement that one may have with the potential sponsor. Um, the other thing about a regional approach, I think I support that wholeheartedly. Um, the case of Australia being aggressive and getting a deal uh, with Google, I think it was some months ago, stands out as, as, um, as a good signpost for us to pursue that, that objective. Um, also, we should examine the possible establishment of a special fund or trust fund with contributions from these large Caribbean companies um, that, of course, are benefited one way or the other from very small, by very small advertising rates in a number of countries with huge populations. There is a great disparity um, between and among advertising rates in the various countries. I think that a percentage of something should be given to a regional fund on an annual basis for independent media production. So it will, in some way, remove any possibility of conflict of interest if we all say, well, you know, the media can access the fund um, and they can cover it right freely, as opposed to approaching a particular media house and you say, oh, well, I can't write about the telecoms sector because they have a vested interest in a particular issue and it may put them in a bad shade. So those are my, those are my points. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know who wants, to, who wants to comment on what Dennis just said. Anybody want to take that? 
Um, I, I agree with Dennis, and this is what I was um, suggesting. You know, there are ways, and, and maybe it cannot be done regionally, you know, off the bat, but you have to look at it locally. But there are ways where tax incentives can be offered to, to companies who contribute to a type of fund that goes back into independent journalism. And I think that it is one of the things that, that needs to be looked at. The thing is, though, that um, we can all sit here and talk and talk and talk and everybody sits and talks and talks, but who is going to do it? Somebody has to take the bull by the horn and lead the effort and get the buy-in from everybody. And I think that that really is the biggest challenge, quite honestly, because it's gonna take a lot of time, energy and effort to get it done. Um, Kiran, if you permit, and as well as the chairman, uh, perhaps as a starting point, um, the Association of Caribbean Media Workers or um, a number of other organizations can join under that umbrella. And then the issue is the first step, the Caribbean private sector organization uh, and the, the CARICOM secretariat for whatever it's worth um, to try to commence that engagement and see where it leads. Okay, there's some, I mean, the chat is blowing up. There's so many fabulous points there. I'm trying to figure out which one to jump off on. But let me start with this comment by Raymond, who says, nonprofit news would suggest that there is for-profit news. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what many of us are in now, Raymond. He says, let's talk. And then Eureka says, will that not jeopardize our freedom? Will they not want to, to control the news? I'm not sure who the they is in, in, in that Eureka. But that issue of nonprofit news versus for-profit news, um, Kiran, you raised it, so let me just let you pick up on that quickly. No, I mean, I think there has to be an understanding of what the nonprofit news is, right? Um, you, you're not going, you cannot be influenced, and you're not going to be influenced, right? It, it is the independent um, opinions and the independent findings. I shouldn't say opinions, I should say findings in those stories. Does it mean that you run at a loss? No. But does it mean that you are trying to satisfy a shareholder? No. That is the biggest um, differentiator. You're not bowing to the whims and fancies of a shareholder who is telling you you have to make 10% more, you have to make 15% more. You know, that is not what you're doing. So you need to understand the distinction and how this model would work. But it is something that I could spend all day talking about because I'm very passionate about it. But let's um, understand that that is the distinctive factor. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Nazima to come in and respond to the comment that Dennis just made when he was saying, is there a role here for the Association of Caribbean Media Workers? And I'll twin that with a comment from Wesley, who says media workers are typically excluded from the discussions on media models. Thank you, Dion. And certainly, I do share the sentiments um, of Wesley and Dennis. We're often excluded uh, from this level of debate and ought to be included. I think we have very valuable contributions to make. Um, Dennis's uh, contribution is one that can be explored, and certainly I'm open to exploring it. All right, now, Brian, I'm going to ask you to take this question from Janiko. Um, she's asking, do advertisers understand the change in the media market? Are our media sales execs doing enough to educate our advertisers on what is working and what is not so efficient in terms of ad spend? <laughs> and I find the question as well interesting Very because, again, I remember uh, someone telling me that, you know, they were having trouble getting advertisers on the digital space because they were very in tune with the old school model and then COVID came, you know, everybody went online and suddenly advertisers were lining up. But, but go ahead, Brian. Um, yeah, it, 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 that's a very interesting conversation, um, point that has been brought up. I could go on that all day um, because the data becomes important and and person's personal experience. Because what you find interestingly, there's a lot of online advertising that absolutely, and social media advertising that absolutely does not work. And it's not worth, a, and it gives you absolutely no value for money. And the traditional media is still way ahead. However, there is that personal side to it where um, a client does something and then they get some sort of feedback immediate feedback because it's a social media feed and they're like, oh my gosh, this thing is blowing up. 200 people have responded or 150 people have responded or a thousand people have responded. But 
you ha then have a media outlet that is giving you 300,000, 400,000 people. Where is your value for money? So, so I, I see what is happening now is that people are still in this stage where they're trying to understand what different media types do and what kind of power they have. And, and, and it's very interesting because typically what we see is that social media is very good at creating conversation, but traditional media remains superior in creating conversion. That is turning that person into a, a paid client. There are always going to be exceptions to the rule. You're a party promoter, you only need to get 200 people. That's a different situation. So scale, scale, everything comes back to scale again, you know? Um, and, and I just wanted to weigh in just a little bit on the earlier, the earlier points that were being made um, in terms of, of things to try and help independent media. I think what we need to do is try and create, try and push and advocate for incentives that benefit media houses directly. Because the one problem with funds, whatever kind of donor funding it is, is that when donor funds priorities change, that funding dries up. And, and we see that with NGOs all the time. So we don't want journalism now to be subject to that. So there has to be some sort of mechanism that is so directly tied to journalistic output that it doesn't fall prey to just changes in priorities, whatever they may be by donors. All right, here's a great comment from Wilfred. George, I'm gonna ask you to respond to this. Wilfred says, with regard to the issue of big tech following George's proposal, it's also important that in this collaboration, we work on unique media content and products that mainly have a global impact. Asking you to comment on that, but against the background as well as somebody who straddles news and sports, you know, where news is many times a lot more parochial. If you're speaking, you're muted. Hold on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, right. All right. Let me let me let me start with the sports part for sports part first. We are in a region of the world where we have things to tell the world about the sporting prowess of our seniors and our juniors that people want to hear. So, in the way that I gave the example of Bleacher Report and the score and them tailoring content to the mass audience for well-established events and people can't see them because people want to know. We have various, the Caribbean is still big on cricket, regardless of what some may think about the health of the game in the region. Cricket has a massive following. Uh, there are games played, the West Indies four day, Barbados, I mean, it's cricket match, so there's always cricket there. Uh, the Antigans play it as well. Well, we all play it everywhere, guy and everywhere else. The point is that people outside who want to know about big performances, who want to see clips, who want to see highlights, there is still nowhere in the Caribbean for them to, all right, let me go on this site or let me download this app and I can get that information. So there is the space for something like that to be created by an existing entity like mine, Sportsmax, or like by, by somebody else, like a group of entrepreneurs coming together and say, okay, we're going to put this together, put this app together. We're going to have our, our correspondence here, there, and there. They're going to give us the files this way. We're going to upload real time and we are going to get it out so that people can consume this way. Where the news is concerned, look, the diaspora is so large and the diaspora is a place we obviously have to start with because of course, what is... Uh, I mean, front page news, the way that Jamaicans get up, who've never been to London before, you get up and you read The Guardian, you read The Telegraph, and you read The Times, and you can't tell me everything that happened in the House of Commons, and what the Lib Dems are saying, and the, 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 everything that happens, what Sir Lindsay Hoyle in the House of Commons, the Speaker said, all of these things. People who are Brits don't take up the Gleaner just like that, or take up the Antigua Sun just like that, or take up the Newsday just like that. Yeah, so it is that we have to appeal us here in the region to what I'm going to call the diasporans. Funny, I've never seen that word. Maybe I'll make, I'll submit that as a word that to be made because it makes sense. Diasporans, well, diaspora, the diaspora is large. The, 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 the number of Trinis, Guyanese, uh, v, uh, Vincentians, Kittitians who are in Canada, who are in the tri state, you're in New York, New Jersey, New York, all of those places. And you get from them that boy, 
you know, I want to know what's going at home, but, you know, I see so-and-so on that station sometimes, but I don't get enough and I don't have an app while I'm on the move to be able to check it and I get alerts. There is the possibility for that to exist as well. So this is how, it's, it's not that you're going around big tech, but as the established media entity or as a group of entrepreneurs who want to come together to fill a need, you can find a way to service a need that exists and monetize it. And that is what I mean about the innovation. Who will take the lead? What will Guardian Media do where their social network, um, their, their, their social network department is concerned? What will the Gleaner do to advance its own claims? What will the Jamaica Observer do? These are the things that I'm talking that can open up new revenue streams, that can bring carriage to the advertising dollar, and that can make the traditional media houses and the entrepreneurs who come new to the scene see the way they are going and see a financial path by virtue of the business that they do. Oh, Deidre in the chat says, Julian Rogers says last word is a word. Sorry, sorry Dion. Julian says last word is a word. Oh God, because I've been using it, I never checked it. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you very much. Good, good, good. <laughs> okay, Deidre says the issue of balancing economic viability versus journalistic integrity is a tightrope in even larger operations. The challenge becomes even tighter when the political arena, particularly government and political parties are big advertisers and the public sector may contribute a subvention. And we've seen this in the Eastern Caribbean where you know, if a, if a media house is, is critiquing government that advertising is pulled and suddenly the viability of the media house is, is severely threatened. And I'd love to know your thoughts, um, Larry, especially when you're talking small entities, startups, should they be steering completely away from the idea of taking any money from government if you're to run a, 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 you know, a startup news organization with integrity? Thank you for asking me such an easy question to answer. Um, <laughs> There's, there's, uh, the, the short answer is no, I don't think they should shy away from it, but, you know, it, it, taking it without, finding a way to take it without being pressured by it is, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's a case in Africa, in Zambia, where all government advertising went to government owned media, and the media companies banded together to uh, because of COVID, actually, as it was a co it was seen as a COVID relief thing, the private media said we need some of this too, and the government agreed. They get something like twenty percent of the government's advertising now. But how it's distributed and what, what they they feel in, in Zambia they feel, well they feel that uh, they're the government's getting a service for it, so they can you know if they want to uh, do a public service announcement on COVID, uh, you know, what to do to, to, to prevent COVID, uh, they're, getting, they're getting value for it. So in order to uh, resist government pressure for that advertisement, they basically treat them like other advertisers. And they say, you are getting value for, for money. You don't need anything more. Uh, whether that's effective or not, that can, that's debatable. Not a new problem, of course. It, it has nothing to do with the, to this age. It's always been an issue, but the, the, uh, there's an advocacy issue involved in that to ensure that government officials and the public understand that this only works if there's no, if there's no pressure uh, tied to, uh, th that there's no quid pro quo, if you will. Okay, um, Kieran. Now Earl is asking: Isn't there a danger of undue influence, even from quote-unquote neutral internationals? Although Wesley suggesting independent is a better word. Um, Earl says there could be cultural differences between an international funding agencies and agency and recipients of the generosity in a particular country. For instance, there are hot button issues on which a funding agency might be more progressive than the recipient of the funds, and you end up with the funder seeking to compromise the independence of the journalist. And, and again, you have a lot of experience with international funders. Is this a real concern that Earl is expressing? It is a concern, but the thing is, if you are running the, the media output in the way that we do, you would say that there's no yes, editorial independence. You are doing what you have to do based on the needs of your, in our case, of the region. 
And you have to be able to say no. And I think that's why it's very important to know who are the individuals behind these kinds of organizations running them. And I think that speaks volumes, and I think also to the work. And you have the same um, issue that Larry is talking about, and that was raised in the chat, where, where we have undue influence, even in private sector, right? The reality is in our region, 50% of revenue comes from government in, in some of our countries. So two things. One is the there is no influence as far as we go with MIC and CIJN. They have absolutely no control of, over our editorial content. We're very independent and um, we have full editorial control. And secondly, what you do, the work you do will also speak volumes to the audiences you serve. Should that happen, you know, the audiences will be able to tell. So we have to look at it that way and we have to be prepared that sometimes if you go the way of funding, there are times you're going to have to say no. If you want to maintain your independence, we have had to say no, I'll be quite honest, I'll tell everybody here, we have been approached by entities who wanted certain things done, but because of the editorial control, they seem to want to have influence over, you know, what we're saying. We said absolutely not. And you're going to have to put your foot down. And I have Visho Harry, I think that is, saying, Bran, companies are saying they can advertise for free or well, maybe close to free on social media. So why would they want to advertise on your online platform? On my online platform or on the traditional, okay. Let me take it both ways. Um, yes, there's some, amount, there's, there's some amount of advertising that can be done for free. Um, and you know, as the kind of Jew I am where freeness exists is folly to resist. Okay, but <laughs> um, what is really important on advertisers' results. And the truth is that just in the same way that in the past, you'd have to have a particular marketing mix where you would probably include, depending on your product, TV, radio, outdoor, magazine, flyers, posters, whatever. We really just need to kind of understand that social media and so on is now just another part of that total mix. But it comes back to the results. Are you getting the results or not? And I mean, I can certainly tell you from my experience, we've had a lot of clients who said, well, we're going social media and we're doing this and they cancel their contracts and all of that. And trust me, in no time, they're, they're back. So there's, there's a point at which you have to have confidence in your, your product and what you can deliver. That's important. But you have to realize that there is something else in this total media mix um, that is available to to advertisers and it's, it's just competition. And from that point of view, you really just have to deal with it and, and embrace it. Dion, may, may, may I suggest, may I say something on that? Yeah, man. Yeah, so so that thought that, you know, the, the companies can go on social media themselves and hence why the need to advertise with a media entity. The, 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 the principle, uh, the, 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 so, the social media space is the roadway. An entity that has a proven track record for something is the vehicle. You want a vehicle to take you along the roadway. Roadway, and the fact is that if, say, for instance, IRFM or Zip, in the case of brands, brands entities, they they are a vehicle and they offer a carriage that the company, the, the advertiser, but the entity by themselves on their website don't get anybody to share the post that they make because it's a it's a, it's a consumer product. Nobody's sharing that. But they share things that come on Zip's website, they share things on IRFM website. So it goes across many platforms, it goes to many eyes. People build a buzz around it, and there is a buzz around IRFM and Zip FM and these entities because of the work that they do and the things, the content they put out, and people are always checking for updates from them all the time. That doesn't happen with the entity who decides to be on social media and open an Instagram page and put that they have hot pepper sauce now made with peppers from the St. Elizabeth Valley. It doesn't happen like that because there is no carriage. Nobody's going to go to the dedicated page to look and say, oh, there's a new hot sauce here. Share it with one person. And by the end of the day, it's shared with 400,000 persons or 40,000 persons. Unless there's some controversy, unless somebody died from eating it, then now it becomes something that is shared widely. And then even so, the traditional media house who reports a story about that, that's where the shares come and it goes across people and it makes an impact. It leaves a footprint that you can then print a report at the end of a quarter, end of an end of a period and say to your client, well, 
this is how many people we tracked it going across and look at the times that people clicked on the article or clicked on the link to the thing and all of that. You won't get that by the end of just putting up the thing on their own social media page. So it is that the, the, the media entity, the entity in the business of doing these things has the capacity to carry the message where the entity by itself could never hope to. Um, there's another thing there too um, that you, you, you touched on, George, which is because a, a, an established media entity also does have an advantage, which is they are established. So when you look on legal issues, if there's any sort of legal issue surrounding post or um, information put out, we because of what we do, we do have a lot of safeguards around content that a lot of independent people may not have. Um, and also we are held to a higher standard of accountability, which is only to the benefit of an advertiser anyway. And that is something that as media houses, we, we also need to, to emphasize on your point where our social media platforms um, are concerned as well. A right, couple of comments here. Milton says the model of taxing big tech who are making huge amounts in the Caribbean is being followed in other jurisdictions like Ireland and Australia. In Ireland, the plan is to support investigative journalism in particular, which is what we desperately need. But he says the biggest challenge is convincing regional governments this is good for democracy when many are currently trying to sideline traditional newsrooms. And I'm going to twin to that Julian's question, can we not convince the telecom authorities to set aside a portion of the huge license fees they get to pack back independent media initiatives? And ask though, isn't part of the problem there that the telecom companies are now positioning themselves as content creators and media houses as well? So um, exhibit A, for instance, flow. Um, so does, does that, and Dig Digicel as well, so does that not, how does that work into, into, into the suggestion there? So um, I think both of those questions speak to regulatory and legislative kinds of initiatives going forward. Kiran, um, what do you think? Yeah, they do. And, and you know, and we made that point and definitely it's, it's one of the recommendations you will see come out of the media viability indicator study that was done. Um, it needs to happen if we have to really uh, save the industry that we're in. And it has to start at a local level, which is why we're hoping that at this stakeholder meeting, something could be done. But apart from the regulation with regards to the economic aspect, we need to understand there's other legislative framework. And Dion, you know that better than anybody else, right? Even if we get the funding, our investigative reporting is falling prey to other obstacles. So whether it is how the ATI is handled, whistleblower legislation, which I know you have your whole take on data protection act, there are other aspects we also need to look at. So understand that we can't only look at the economic viability and legal framework without looking at what else exists that is impinging upon our rights as investigative journalists. And I just wanted to make that point. All right. Anybody else want, on the panel want to comment on that issue before I ask for final comments and wrap? All right. No? Okay. Let me go around the room with final comments because we're in our final three minutes here. And again, I have absolutely loved the discussion and comments in the chat. Bran, final comments from you in terms of way forward. We have made um, a bunch of recommendations coming out of the study. And I think what everybody needs to do is stay tuned to this space when those things come out. I don't want to preempt that. I mean, trust me, I've been chomping at the bit, you know, to, <laughs> to, to, to speak about some of the recommendations. But we're going to be, um, like I said, there's a stakeholder meeting on the 21st um, where we will be discussing those things. Um, and we will be releasing the, the document this the end of this week on, on the MCI, MIC website, right, Kiran? Yes, it's actually up on the website now. We load it on midnight, just, just for everybody here to be able to access it. Right. And, and we would love the feedback because anything, any feedback that we can get in the interim to carry into, into um, that stakeholder meeting would, would certainly be invaluable. Okay. Kieran, for you. Um, I just want to say that, you know, this is really the start, and I hope that you all appreciate that what we're trying to do here, as I said before, is really save our industry. For me, it's a much larger picture than that. It is really about saving our societies and ensuring the survival of our democracies. That is really how I look at it. And I think that all of us have to work together starting today 
to figure out what do we have to do, not just as individuals, but as associations. So whether it is ACM, whether it is your local associations, we need to start coming together and we need to get the messaging across and do it the right way and keep the public informed of what some of these issues are because they will not be able to read through what the repercussions could be. We need to point that out to them. So I hope that we could do that in the interest um, of all of us and in the interest of tomorrow. All right, George. Well, what I would say is that I think the people who matter, meaning all of us are keyed into the real issue we face, the situation that is in front of us. Um, I have no doubt that we have the awareness to know which approach to fashion and which, 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 which door of power we should knock on to be enabled in our fight for survival, and not just to survive, but to thrive. And this discussion, more than useful in that regard, and the, the Press Association of Jamaica myself stand ready to assist in this very important regard, we're ensuring that we have the way we thought, the possibility to continue doing journalism, to continue doing journalism without the yoke of, of, of censorship, without you know being in anybody's pocket or upsetting any paymaster. And of course, where big tech is concerned, which is what the first part of the point was addressing, that you know we will find a solution that is workable for all, no one into the future. And Larry, final word to you. Um, yes, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank all the feedback. Uh, I've never seen a chat blow up on a conference <laughs> like this one has. It, it, it's remarkable. And uh, in terms of what's going to work, you know, I, I'll, I'll defer to my, my colleagues on what would work for the Caribbean. Um, but I think the point of the, the discussion with all of the suggestions that come up is that, and, and what it seems to me is, you know, finding a mechanism that will allow outside revenue, uh, non-traditional revenue, without uh, compromising editorial uh, independence. That's really the key of this. Um, and also, uh, it's not going to be just one solution. There's going to be multiple initiatives that, 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 are, that work. Look, in, in Canada, um, where, they're, where they're, they're going directly for revenue from the platforms, it's been incredibly controversial and difficult and convoluted. I mean, how's that going to work in the Caribbean where you have multiple countries, multiple uh, points of view? Uh, it may not work, but maybe uh, subsidies or tax credits, or there, there's, there's many, many ways uh, forward. And any solution is going to include uh, more than one of them. There is no one single solution. All right, I would say to you, I would say to you, Larry, you should stick with MIC because all MIC webinars are like this because the topics are always so very relevant and so important and, and the best in the business are brought to the table to discuss them. So thank you all so very much. I'm handing you back over to Kieran now to segue to the second part of the webinar. Thank you very much, Dion. I just want to say a special thank you to Larry because I know he's going to, to maybe be leaving us. I know he's a few hours ahead, but Larry, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the board of directors at MIC for making the time to be here with us. And I know that I've already told you, I want everybody to know, I'm trying to get Larry to do some more stuff with us. So um, I'm hoping that he can be part of our roaming faculty. But Larry, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your insights and experiences. Truly appreciate it. Larry, you remember what I said in the introduction? She does not take no for an answer. Be warned. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. This, is, this has been good, good for me. I've enjoyed this very much. And I appreciate the invitation. And uh, this has been a really, really good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Dion, thank you for moderating. And I hope that you'll stay on. Um, just for you all to know, Dion already grabbed up MIC for her discussion on her radio show this evening. <laughs> so, so you know a veteran, right? But um, Dion, thank you for that. And we will be, we will be on. And um, George, thank you as well. Um, you had me in panic mode when I didn't see you at five minutes before the session, but, but thank you also. So um, Brian, I know that you also have to run. Um, sincere thanks and thanks on behalf of MIC and myself, you know, for working as diligently as you did um, on the report going above and beyond, and we truly appreciate it. 
So we are going um, to our break at this point. We have a 15 minute break. We know that everybody, well, actually we're gonna make it 10 minutes. We know you guys have to check your email and probably make some calls because it is a work day. So you can stay on or you can leave Zoom and come back with the same link, but um, we are going to be here and we will restart in 10 minutes time. Thank you. <laughs> 